Ladies and gentlemen, um, I have a man who uh, is supposed to do the national anthem. He hasn't showed. Um, I don't know what happened. He comes from Newport, and maybe he got behind a little bit. What I'd like to do is start off with the Pledge of Allegiance, and then I'm going to have Pastor Ed Wheeler uh, do an invocation for us, and we're going to get started. So if everybody could come up, and uh, we're going to do a Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Ed Wheeler. He's pastor of Bible Valley Church in Middlebury, and he's going to do the invocation for us. Thank you, Jim. Let's, uh, let's pray. Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, O God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God of Moses, God of King David and the prophets, God of the Lord Jesus Christ, God of our nation, God of Washington and Lincoln and Frederick Douglass and Martin Luther King, thank you for bringing us together today. Thank you for making the United States a great nation. Thank you for shedding your grace on America. We confess our sins of the past and even of this day. Forgive us and bathe us in your mercy and grace. Please give us wisdom. Give us courage, give us insight, give us clarity, give us power, give us patience, give us unity in your truth and light. Lord, strengthen our minds, strengthen our hearts, strengthen our hands, strengthen our spirits, and strengthen our wills. May you be glorified through us this day and in the days to come, and make us all true patriots worthy of the name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Yep. Hallelujah. There you go. Woo! Thank you, Ed. Um, <clears throat> Mike Hall, uh, you out here, Mike? Come on up, please. Let me introduce you as a former chief of uh, no, retired chief. Sure. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is Mike Hall. Mike is a retired chief from uh, Manchester Police Department, and he also did a uh, Senate run, I believe, in Wyndham County? Bennington, Bennington County. Um, and Mike is a very good friend of mine. And uh, let's give him a round of applause and welcome him, please. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Jim, and thank you all for coming out today to help support the patriots of our great state of Vermont as well as the great patriots of the United States of America. As a retired police officer, basically means I don't have to go to work anymore <laughs> to uh, draw the paycheck that I've enjoyed and the career that I have enjoyed for nearly 40 years. But I'd never, as anyone in police work will tell you, never fully retire from law enforcement, you're always and it's in your blood, it's what you do. A number of years ago, I created a organization called the Vermont Police Coalition. And I started this coalition some time ago when I first observed that the law enforcement voice in the state of Vermont was being silenced and was being suppressed. And I spoke quite extensively about that at the time to no avail to a number of different uh, fellow police officers and police chiefs. And uh, lo and behold, I was spot on. What you're finding today in today's law enforcement field is a great exodus. Uh, a lot of the veteran people are leaving the profession in uh, droves for a number of reasons. And I don't think that I need to tell you what those are. We, we have a uh, situation in this country where criminals are being portrayed as celebrities and the good guys are being portrayed as criminals. 
and nothing could be further than the truth. As someone who spent their entire lifetime in the profession, I can tell you without any question that we do make mistakes, we do have some bad apples, but nobody hates a bad cop worse than the good police that do what they do for our people in our community. Every time I have an opportunity to talk to folks about the law enforcement profession, I keep reminding people that we are no different than your sons and daughters, relatives, co-workers, and other relatives that you have. It's just that we do a very different job. And we do the kind of dirty work that most people, I wouldn't say don't want to do, but they don't have to do, and we do it, and uh, seldom complain. But my speech today is going to take it a little different direction than what it normally does is because I, I observed some stuff here most recently that's been pretty disturbing to me and some of the folks out there today may not want to hear this, but folks, if you support the police and you support law and order in this country, you need to get out of your easy chair and off the sofa and get out there and start supporting us because the bottom line is we're losing this battle. And when I say that is we have great patriots such as you folks here today, but you just recently had an election in Burlington Ward 3 where the choice between the candidates was a gentleman who was pro-law enforcement, pro-law and order, and, and pro-civilized society versus the guy who wants to abolish the police. Well, in Ward 3, you have about 4,000 people. 22% of the population showed up to vote. And guess who got elected? The guy that wants to abolish the police. Well, let me tell you folks, if you're in Burlington, live in Burlington, or have family, friends, or relatives up there, you people better start waking up and seeing what's taking place before your own eyes up there. You have a bunch of loons running your city. You have people up there that don't care about your safety. Burlington's a shooting gallery. Don't believe me, just turn on Channel 3 News any night of the week. You have business owners on Church Street that are afraid to open up their business because you've basically opened it up to a public cesspool. Folks, you can't allow this to happen. This is your country, this is your town, this is your city, this is your state. If you allow these people to continue to take us down the path that we're going, things are going to progressively get worse. If you support law enforcement, if you support law and order, if you support decency, if you support the American way of uh, capitalism, if you work, you do good things and you get ahead. We need to change the direction of this country. And the only way we're gonna do that is to, again, get off the easy chair, get off the sofa, get out there and vote and more importantly, become involved. Because if you leave it up to the people that are the ones that are organized enough to organize people to get out to vote, they're gonna have it their way. And if you want it that way, then that's fine. But if you don't, then you need to do something. And you know what I would say to my colleagues and fellow officers in Burlington, you need to really consider, do you, do you want to work for an agency or a city that doesn't care about you? Do you really want to work for a place that doesn't have your back, so to speak? Folks, there are a lot of law enforcement agencies. In fact, almost every one, every agency in the state of Vermont is looking for law enforcement people. Go to work someplace where you're going to be appreciated. Go to work someplace where when you put your uniform on, the people that are out there in the public want you and support you. And I'm not suggesting that everybody in Burlington is like that. By no means am I suggesting that. But what I am suggesting is that this people, the good people in Burlington that don't want it that way, you need to start speaking up and telling the truth and, and holding these clowns accountable that you got running your city up there. And you know, when you start doing that, you're gonna get some crap from people. But let me tell you something, as someone that spent 40 years in police business, 
You never do anything that's right without getting crap from people. You know, when you enforce the laws, you get pushback. When you enforce people doing bad things to make them stop, you're going to get pushback. And, you know, I can't emphasize enough to people that it's time to push back. It's time to stop being the nice guy and just allowing people to push and shove you around and having you submit to things that you don't agree with. And uh, a year ago this past July, Jim Sexton put on uh, a support the police rally right here. And we stood here and we saw what true civil disobedience and disobedience of the law and public civility amounted to when we had a bunch of folks from the Burlington area and different areas come in and surround this gathering and suppress what was meant to be a celebration of law enforcement. You know, it didn't get a whole lot of press, didn't get much of a police response. And I went home that day saying to myself, you know, I wonder what would have happened if we'd reversed those roles. If those same people that interrupted our gathering here on July 4th a year and a half ago were to have been interrupted by a bunch of pro-law enforcement people that just didn't believe in what they thought. You know, you know what the answer to that would have been. And, uh, you know, we've got a very, very delicate situation in this country right now. And we're at a tipping point where if the American people, the good, hardworking, solid Americans, don't start standing up and telling these people when to get off, we're headed down the wrong road, and we're not too far from the point of no return, in my opinion. Uh, I've run for state office. I wasn't successful. That doesn't mean anything in today's world. That just means that you didn't get your voice out there enough. But there's certainly enough censorship and enough propaganda that's being pushed out there that people are buying into, and in some cases, they don't know any different. But one thing you do know that is different is when you know that you're not comfortable sleeping in your bed at night wondering whether or not some thug's gonna kick your door in and steal your belongings or, you know, pose a threat to you and your family. I don't have to teach you that, that comes natural. And people have that fear. People have that fear that live in different parts of the state today that I know. 25 years ago, I used to tell people the only reason why you kept your door locked in Vermont was because you didn't want anybody to let the dog out. Today, you can't leave your car unattended for five minutes to go into the local store to buy something to eat or drink without coming back wondering whether your car is still going to be there or whether or not your purse or contents are still in your vehicle. Again, we've made being a criminal a celebrity and the good guys out to be the criminal. And it's a tough thing to keep your head up high every day and look back on a career and a profession where you know that the vast majority of the people that work in that profession are good people. But for those of us that have been there, been through the footsteps and fulfilled the career in law enforcement, I know that Vermont is not a racist state. I know that the vast majority of police officers are not racist, okay? And you, you, you can bring some transplant here from Minnesota or Michigan or Chicago that's gonna tell you that, 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 that we are. And I'm gonna tell you they don't know what the hell they're talking about, and they're just talking about stuff that they know nothing about. Now, I can't speak to what happens out in Minnesota or Chicago or one of those places. All I can talk about is my experiences here in Vermont. And I can tell you that, you know, if you're a racist in Vermont, believe me, people know it, and they'll know who you are. And you're not gonna work in a police agency or you're not gonna work in any government capacity for very long because we just aren't going to tolerate it. And I take exception to anyone. And when I say that, anyone, including the guy that sits in the big chair behind me, 
to suggest in any way, shape, or form that I'm a racist in any way or have any kind of racist attitude. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I know I know nothing about his personal life, and he doesn't know anything about mine, and I don't appreciate him projecting or pretending to know that he knows anything more about me than I know about myself. And as long as we have that kind of mentality perpetuating society today where you've got people that can tell you that you're racially insensitive or biased because it's born into you and there's no way that you can make any difference about it because you're a racist, you just don't know it, is quite frankly, from the words of a true Vermonter, bullshit. Okay? And, uh, and with that, uh, I'll wrap it up. That'll give them enough to tear me apart here for a few days. So, till we speak again, thank you. God bless. Thank you for supporting law enforcement. I just want to say a couple of things about what Mike just said is that uh, my dad was a cop and he was a good cop. And almost every one of them are. There's bad people, bad police officers, bad teachers, bad mayors, bad governors. But I want you to know that these are the people. When you dial 911, there's somebody sitting in an office someplace that's answering the phone. And their heart is going out to you and they're doing everything they can to get somebody there to take care of you in the worst freaking moment of your life. And those are the people that are wearing the police officers' uniforms, the fire officers' uniforms, and the first responders' uniforms. And they got to tell people, let's say, we got to defund the police, we got to stop the law enforcement. No, we don't. And the people that are mostly affected when you take away law enforcement are low-income people and vulnerable people. So uh, you see a cop dump things stand up for these people and when somebody says we need to defund the police ask them why and ask them who's going to help i got a shirt home it was made by a philadelphia police officer and on the shirt it says you hate cops next time you need help call a crackhead see how that goes so enough of my rant i want to let you all know you know you're looking around and see you know where's everybody well i want to let you know you are everybody you are essential. Everybody that's here, I am thankful for. God bless you all. And with that, I want to introduce Michael Desitels. Michael is a former owner of the UPS store up in Newport, the one that uh, Donovan filed three civil lawsuits against because Mr. Desitels did not break any laws. Um, Michael's a good friend of mine. Give him a chance. Welcome him, please. Thank you, Mike, for speaking earlier. Um, before we start, there's another event coming up, September 10th and 11th, the uh, hostile takeover. Uh, we made the cards for the for the event coming up, and I said I would I would push it up here before we before I spoke. I'm usually not uh, much for writing stuff, and then speaking from a letter, but uh, Jim has helped me get in contact with other people that are, are good at writing stuff. This is a letter that I, uh, we have sent to the governor. We also want to send it out to every legislator, every news media throughout Vermont, throughout the United States, to get our message out there of what's going on. So I'm going to start, this letter is to the people, a warning perhaps of things happening and things to come. We live here in a time where small freedoms are being taken away, silently and without protest. They are adding up and creating a world where we no longer have a say of what happens to our bodies, our children, our families, our jobs, our homes, our privacy. We live in a world where injustice prevails because science is ignored and people who speak up are discounted. Facts are not treated as such but what government needs to do them to be. Too many people accept what is easily to believe. My story is infuriating, painful, unjust, and something I never expected. It's a parallel with what's happening during the beginning stages of the Holocaust. This may seem extreme, 
but anyone who follows history will see the likeliness of the Nazis that took over control of the mass media and education system used them to dismantle their ideology. ideology. <laughs> how they created fear to bring obedience. There is a reason for the memoirs, histor historical books, and documentaries. Every sordid tale of what happened then, and there is a reason for my story. As ins insignificant as it may seem in comparison, it all started with a small freedom lost. I'm the former U owner of the UPS store in Newport, Vermont. My business was not only affected by the pandemic, but was ultimately taken away because I did not enforce the mask mandate, a mandate that is now being construed as scientifically unnecessary and invalid. On the box of the said required mask is a warning label that reads, will not provide protection against COVID-19 coronavirus or any other virus and contaminants. This label exists because there is an abundance of scientific evidence that is, virus itself is smaller than the fibers of the mask and can easily fit through the material. There is a substantial evidence regarding harmful side effects and prolonged mask wearing. Reputable immunologists and vir virologists will and have been tested, uh, been attested to this. Dr. Fauci's emails admit this as well. So the letter is about two things, scientific fact being ignored and illegal action against me by the way of disregarding the Constitution. This letter is not to only about my court case, but other worrisome obstacles that are surfaced as a result of my case. This letter is a notice to the people that our freedom should, be, should not lie in the hands of a few, but in the hands of the citizens. My case begins with a state correspondence with the UPS store corporate office because I would not wear a mask. This resulted in the UPS store pulling my franchise. The state then sued me for putting people in danger and placed a restraining order on me. I was served with papers and had to appear in court within 10 days. The first restraining orders are protective orders used in situations involving domestic violence, child abuse, stalking, harassment, and sexual assault. To have a restraining order placed on me is not only inappropriate, but damaging to my reputation. Second, a 10-day turnaround was not enough time to secure a proper lawyer, witnesses, and little time for preparation. My, case, my cases do not make it to trial. Uh, most cases do not make it to trial for years. I was slighted the opportunity for a fair trial. Whether I adhere to the mask mandate is irrelevant. I am entitled to a fair trial. My quest to find a, a lawyer provided difficulty as many felt intimidated by the state. I was personally threatened a few days after being served by Attorney General T.J. Donovan. Donovan called me informing he had investigated me and knew about my other sources of income, a threat tactic nonetheless. I found one lawyer and wanted to file a countersuit but was told the state was protected so that I was not, that was not an option. I have since found out that this is false information. Remember, I was denied enough time to prepare. The court proceedings began with the COVID-19 regulations reducing my ability to confer with my lawyer to email or text. My lawyer lived in a rural area with insufficient internet service introducing a lot of communication issues. At the end of the restraining order hearing, the judge state asked the judge asked the state and my and my attorney. Uh, uh, let me go again. At the end of the restraining order hearing, the judge asked the state attorney and my lawyer if they would combine the two cases together. That was the restraining order in the civil case they brought against me. My lawyer agreed without talking to me. I would have never agreed to that. This is one maneuver that denied me a jury. A jury is not required on a, at a restraining order hearing. It is simple between the judged and the judge. The civil case regarding the mass mandate, however, involves a jury. Because they combined the two cases, I was denied a jury, as this proceeded with the rules governing restraining orders. After the trial, I hired a new lawyer, 
he filed a motion to have the civil case, the restraining order case separated so we could have a fair trial involving a jury for the civil case. We were again denied a jury. The Attorney General's office issued a $850 fine. When I complained, they threatened me with a $1,000 per day fine. I lost everything. My $275,000 a year per year business due to unconstitutional mask mandates that says right on the box it protects no one from COVID. Facts matter. Stanford University came out with a report saying that masks are completely worthless in regards to SARS and COVID-19. There is no such thing as an asymptomatic carrier and air-to-air -air transmission is completely false. Healthy kids and adults have a survival rate of 98 to 100 percent. Vermonters who have been co contracted COVID report it was nothing more than a bad flu. The same people die from pneumonia and the flu are the ones dying from COVID. This is not Ebola virus. If it were, and the science said that masks were the answer, I would absolutely abide by the mandate. I am entitled to a fair trial. Vermont Digger wrote an article on Dylan Cody, who was tried for conspiracy to sell, deliver, and grow drugs. Judge T. Shout wrote, the undisputed material facts show that the performance of Mr. Cody's attorney fell below the required standard of practice and the errors prejudged Mr. Cody. Judge Mary T. Shout is the same judge who tried my case. When my lawyer failed me, I was told to sue the lawyer for malpractice. Why did Judge T. Shout exonerate Cody, but not me? I'll say it again, I am entitled to a fair trial. I asked the Governor Phil Scott, who is obligated under constitutional law to protect the citizens to grant me a fair trial with ample time to prepare with a jury. This was his response. Due to the separations of powers, an administration cannot intervene with an active court case. At this point, you are encouraged to communicate your concerns to either our legal representation or your caseworkers so you may learn more about your best course of action for you as you continue to navigate this process. First of all, I didn't ask him to drop the case. I simply asked for a fair trial. A drug dealer, Cody, got more attention than a business owner in the time of COVID. How is this acceptable or legal for him to take the power from our local representation, representatives, making himself the sole decision maker regarding mass mandate? Yet not to have the power to rule in cases involved in justice due to the decision. Furthermore, my case is currently not active. This is the evidence that Scott is brushing this off. My livelihood is being brushed off. Our system has failed us. It has failed us big time. I am turning to you, the people to my story, to get my story out that in some way, some small way, it may help Vermonters keep our freedom. So this is a story that was in vain. I asked you all questions your local representatives for answers that you insist they all do that you insist that they do all they can do to ensure failure fair elections and then vote these immoral politicians out Vermont politicians seem to have forgotten they were who uh, who they work for and it is our duty as patriots to remind them So anybody that is willing to help, I want emails for all legislators and anybody that knows any media outlets that we can get in contact with to get this out. We would like all the help that we can get. Thank you. Thank you for giving me a chance. I want you guys to pay attention to something he said that he wasn't giving a, a fair opportunity uh, by the judicial system. That's happening to uh, good people every day. There is one case after another of attorneys, state's attorneys, siding with people who are criminals. And listen, people make mistakes, but they have to be held responsible for their mistakes. 
I made mistakes. You all made mistakes. And, and you know, whether it was dad putting us in our room or it was, you know, you get kicked out of school or whatever happened, there, there was a result for when you screwed up. Now there isn't. Now the person that you hurt is the one that gets punished physically, financially, and mentally. And I, that's not conjecture. Uh, take a look at anything that's happening in the state's attorney's office in so many counties of the state. And, and Donovan is proactive. Donovan is proactive in supporting Black Lives Matter and, and Planned Parenthood. Uh, we'll, we'll address that later. Um, there's a petition. This first tent right here, the red one with the flags on it, there's a petition down there to support Michael. I'd like to see everybody at some point today put their name on that petition, please. We're going to send that to Scott and Donovan. Um, what happened to this man is an absolute nightmare. And, and just a little while back, a few months ago, maybe after this all happened with Michael, somebody asked Governor Scott, they say, what happens if a store owner doesn't want to enforce the mask mandates? And Scott said, it's their store. They have the rights just as if they can say, uh, no shoes, no shirt, no service. So they can make that decision. That's not up to me. Well, if it doesn't apply to anybody anymore, why are they still trying to find and punish Michael Desertels? So that's why I need everybody's signature on that petition. Get, get over there sometime today, please, and sign that. First hand on the right. I want to bring up Maggie Karen, please. Ladies and gentlemen, Maggie works for uh, Vermont Right to Life. Uh, Maggie's a very good friend of mine and she's going to be speaking today about Prop 5. And you'll understand that from her a whole lot better than from me. Thank you. Appreciate it. It's toasty out here. Thank you all for being here. We have a lot to share, and we need to know what's going on back here. So my job brings me in those doors and under the dome from January to May, so I'm very aware of what happens in the committees and what happens legislatively. So I encourage you to to listen and if you have any questions after I'm more than happy to answer them. I'm going to run a little scripted because I want to make sure to get you the correct information. Am I too cold? Step up close. Okay. No, I think I'm good. Okay. So I'm going to talk about H57 and Proposal 5. H57 is now Act 47. It was passed by both the Vermont House and the Senate during the 2019 legislative session and was then officially signed into law by Governor Scott in May of 2019. H57 is recognized as one of the most horrific abortion bills in the nation, permitting unlimited, unregulated abortion throughout the entire nine months of pregnancy for any reason or for no reason at all. As alarming as H57 is, even more diabolical is Proposal 5. Proposal 5 was introduced by the Vermont Senate and passed in both the House and Senate in 2019. And it was passed again in the Senate in the 2021 legislative session. If it passes the House again in 2022, it will be headed to you, the Vermont voters, for a statewide vote in the general election of November 2022. Proposal 5 is equivalent to H57 on steroids. Proposal 5 reads as follows. Article 22, entitled Personal Reproductive Liberty. That an individual's right to personal reproductive autonomy is central to the liberty and dignity to determine one's own life course and shall not be denied or infringed unless justified by a compelling state interest achieved by the least restrictive means. So what exactly does Proposal 5 mean? According to repeated testimony by members of Legislative Council and the Attorney General's Office, that will be up to the courts to decide. There is absolutely no way to know how far Proposal 5 will extend to secure the right to personal reproductive autonomy. It is not specific to women, it is for all Vermonters. According to proponents and the majority of your legislators, Proposal 5 recognizes this undefined promise of reproductive liberty as a Vermont value. Yet opponents like Vermont Right to Life know that this language was created to be purposely vague and deceitful. 
there is no clear definition in its language. As was addressed repeatedly in legislative committee meetings, Proposal 5 doesn't even mention the word abortion. Vermont Right to Life, the ACLU, the Attorney General's Office, and Legislative Council all recommended adding the word abortion to this language to bring some clarity to its meaning. But Vermont Senate Health and Welfare Committee chose not to do that, preferring instead to leave the meaning of reproductive liberty undefined and open to the court's interpretation for whatever the court feels may fall into that line of language in the future. There is much more to be said about the evils Proposal 5 might mean to our state in the future, including what effect it might have on each individual taxpayer funding such unknown and undefined rights. Vermont Right to Life encourages you to call our office with questions. We ask that you invite us to speak at your churches or organizations. Please attend the required house public hearing be seen and let your voices be heard. Connect your house, contact your House representatives now and tell them to vote no on Proposal 5 when it comes before them again for a House floor vote in the 2022 session. We also encourage you to follow our website at www.vrlc.net and our Vermont Right to Life Facebook page to learn more as Proposal 5 moves, for, excuse me, moves forward through this process. We all recognize that we are in a war for our state, our economic future, and our freedom. If passed, Proposal 5 will open the door for ongoing constitutional amendments, a Pandora's box of only God knows what to follow. We must stop this from happening now. Vermont Right to Life will be hosting a 2021 Life Symposium to address the dangers of enshrining the language of Proposal 5 into our Vermont State Constitution. If you're interested in learning more about this critical issue and would like to register to attend, please see me for a brochure and registration form. Call our office or go to www.vrlc.net to register online. Thank you. I did leave some information at the table. I left, I have business cards. You can find me for business cards. I left a um, life symposium registration and information form down there and also a, a information sheet on the dangers of Proposal 5 with some expert testimony included. So please help yourself to that. And I will be here for the afternoon if you have any questions. Thank you. Yeah, I want to touch on that, what Maggie said. Uh, down in these little tents down here, guys, there's all kinds of information, handouts, packets, contact numbers, cards. If y'all 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 want to help each other and you help ourselves, go, go over to these tents and take a look and see what's going on. These people are all good people. They're here for you and they want to help each other and they want to help you. Um, I recently was introduced uh, on a computer, basically, to this next lady. Um, she's done some pretty amazing things, and I'm quite impressed with it, with what she's done, and she, and you will be as well. Uh, Amy, Amy, are you out here? Amy Hornblast? Okay, she's coming up. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, kids are going back to school soon, and they're going to put masks on your kids again. I want you to understand, uh, several people already touched on it, the masks, have it on the packaging, they won't help. This young lady right here has done a whole lot of work and a lot smarter than I am, so give her a welcome and please... No, Listen to her good. No, I'm not. You're brilliant. You're brilliant. You are my good. Thank you so much. Isn't he wonderful? Woo! Okay. Where stand, should I? Stand close. Stand close. Oh, better. Whoops. I'm not wearing any electronics. He's coming over. So. Oh, okay. He's I can stand. Out. If I'm right here, this works, right, guys? Yeah. Perfect, we found the sweet spot. That's what we're doing today. We're finding the sweet spot, guys. Um, so my name is Amy Hornblass, and a year ago, I was teaching health at the St. Jay School. I'd been there for going on my 10th year, teaching health to kids in pre-K all the way through high school. I taught at the academy too, and I resigned because I couldn't mask kids based on biology and just understanding trauma and all the complicating factors but I didn't know any of the facts, so, because I'd never heard of such a thing. 
So I spent the past year conducting the Vermont Mask Survey, which has gathered evidence that Vermonters are experiencing the negative health effects that we expect them to experience. According to OSHA and the World Health Organization and, and the CDC and everybody, these are known health effects. And they're pretty very serious. We actually don't know what all the health effects are because it would be um, it would be just un unethical to do a study like this. So what I've been focusing on lately are the OSHA standards, bringing those OSHA standards to work put to uh, everybody I can to explain that these are the symptoms of oxygen deprivation and CO2 poisoning according to the CDC and according to OSHA. And we fought for those standards, guys. People died to get those OSHA standards in place. And if we're just gonna throw those out, that, that's very dangerous. That's a dangerous, slippy, slippery slope. Um, the really concerning thing I just noticed is that the early signs of CO2 poisoning and oxygen deprivation are undetectable. Most people are gonna have no symptoms even though it's doing them harm. But once they do start experiencing symptoms such as headache, fatigue, rapid heartbeat, it's already too late. And we know that people are suffering from these symptoms. So what I'm working on right now is going to the schools because we're gonna have kids wear masks all week, all day, which has not been done before. Last year was bad enough. There were a lot of health issues that I heard about through the grapevine, tonsillitis, acne breakouts, difficulty breathing, asthma increasing, and of course, the depression rates amongst youth, which one of the symptoms of CO2 poisoning is depression and anxiety. So how much of this are we causing by the masks? We have no idea because officials are refusing to acknowledge them. What I discovered in my research was that masks have been used as a form of coercion in healthcare settings to convince healthcare workers to get the flu vaccines every year. So now we've moved this coercion technique into the public. So I've, um, oh, so the decision makers, some of you may not be aware that the CDC recommends masks the AOE suggests that we follow the CDC. The federal government is attaching funding to this. All this great manna coming down from heaven and federal funding to the schools is tied to them following the CDC's recommendations. But the decision makers are the school boards or superintendents in each town. These are our neighbors. And there's a reason we have humans in those positions. There's a reason they're not AI, because AI could just push the button and say, do what the CDC says but they're humans with hearts and brains and they're supposed to use them. So I've been showing up and telling them that and holding them accountable. I suggest four types of actions, whatever level you're ready for, if you wanna help the kids and teachers in school. Because the teachers say it's been soul crushing for them too. And they're suffering from health effects and everything. So first of all, we can demand evidence of safety from our school boards and superintendents. They have no evidence that masks are safe for kids. None exists. So push them on that. If you're a parent, be the squeaky wheel. If you're a community member, push for that. Number two, if you have kids in the school and you have to send them, advocate with those teachers. Check in every day. Was my kid exhibiting these symptoms? Were other kids in the classroom exhibiting these symptoms? What did you do about it? You're responsible for supervising respiratory protection. And I'm aware of the OSHA standards, tell them. And if you need to know any of this, you can find it on my website. Um, also inside the school. Let's teach our kids and our frontline workers to complain when they're feeling these symptoms. Tell them that their heart is racing, that they're getting headaches, that they're having trouble breathing. And these people, these supervisors, are going to have to respond. And number four, we're having celebrations of breathing in front of the school on the first day of school, at least in the areas that I'm connected with, and you can organize your own. Um, these are these are positive celebrations. We're gonna bring lots of positive, happy posters. We don't wanna frighten any children, of course. We want them to know that we love them and we care about their health. See, I looked up the word breath in the dictionary and it actually means life, existence. When they're putting masks on us and telling us we can't complain, we can't say anything about how it's hurting us. We can't even acknowledge that level of things. That's stifling our self-preservation instinct. Do you understand how serious that is? That's so serious, especially for the kids. 
Um, I, I used to work with abuse survivors who had experienced domestic and sexual violence, and I noticed the most empowering moment. People would say, isn't that depressing working in those fields? And I'd say no, because when you're in the room, when that abuse survivor says no, it's the most healing, powerful moment on the planet. And right now, our traumas are being used against us. We've all been traumatized through this pandemic. We've got trauma histories in our past. We watch traumatizing media and movies and video games. We are all experiencing this together and they're playing on that. Well, if we meant miraculously heal, and the only thing we can do, the, the best thing we can do to heal is just say no and draw a boundary, we can, in a Tai Chi manner, use their own technique against them because they're trying to prey on our trauma. And we're gonna say, you know what? My healing of this trauma is gonna be the most amazing thing. It's gonna heal the whole planet. So my, uh, oh, and that cooperating will not protect us. A lot of people think it will, but it's just gonna make it worse. So I just wanna end with um, Gandhi because I had a vision, I was thinking about Gandhi and I had a vision a couple weeks ago of people walking hand in hand in the schools with their kids and with their community members and other teachers walking in without masks and just walking in, right? Or walking into your, your place of business or your hospital where you have to go for treatment but hand in hand, and that Gandhi actually used some of those techniques. So he said, you assist an evil system most effectively by obeying its orders and decrees. An evil system never deserves such allegiance. Allegiance to it means partaking of the evil. A good person will resist an evil system with his or her whole soul. We're gonna grow good people here. This is gonna be the biggest upflooring of good people on the planet. Thank you. Yeah, thank you much, Amy. You guys getting this? You know, pe these people that are speaking up here, you know who they're standing up for? They're standing up for every one of you and they're standing up for your kids. And you guys got to stand up for your kids. You got you got to go to school board meetings. You know it's got to start there. You got to go to school board meetings. You got there's a lady up in Essex Junction. Her name's Liz Cady. And uh, she won an election last November in Essex. I'm from Essex, and uh, not a whole lot of conservative and Republican people in Essex Junction, Vermont. She defeated probably one of the most progressive people on the school board. And, and I got to tell you, I sent shockwaves through them. But she's outgunned eight to one. And she is under merciless attacks from so many people, even in the town. It's just like, are you crazy? This is a young mother, and, and her husband's a military guy who does tours. And, and that's the difference. I want to explain that right now, and you all know it, but I'm going to, I'm going to point it out. Everybody here, you know, we're fighting the good fight. We're, we're, we're trying to do things right. We're trying to do things legally. We're trying to do things by supporting each other. We don't burn crap down. We don't shoot each other. We don't freaking break into houses and cars and <laughs> attack everybody who says no to what we say. You know, your guys' voice matters. Make them hear it. You gotta go to school board meetings. It's gotta start there. You gotta get involved in your local politics. Ask your representatives, your, your, your state representatives, your Republican representatives and senators. Say, okay, you know, you get voted in every time. How come? Because when I look at your record, you don't support the things that I support. You don't stand for the things that I stand for. You know, uh, I'm 100% pro-life in the moment of conception. A lot of people aren't. A lot of Republicans say they aren't. Well, okay, well, what time does it become a baby? You know, the same people that say it's not a baby would fine you $50,000 for breaking an eagle's egg. It's a baby. You know, you know uh, my views aren't extreme. And what you guys say matters. And, and you know, some people say, okay, well, you know, abortion's not really my topic. Okay, maybe 2A is. And, and so the guys behind us, the legislature, and Gov Governor Scott has signed freaking bills into law that take away your rights. Because he was afraid of some kid that had a shotgun who did nothing. And then he had a dream that there was gonna be a school shooting, so he, and in his infinite wisdom, he decides to ban magazines from ARs, not even related closely to what happened in Fairhaven. 
But what I'm saying is, you know what? We may not all agree on every topic, on a two-A, on pro-life, on the Constitution, whatever amendment. Pick one. But you know what? If you care about some of them, you got to care about the others. Because if you don't, and one goes away, you're next. They are actively trying to destroy the Constitution and this building behind me. And Governor Scott either stands out of the way or signs the bills into law. So people like Amy, people like Michael, people like Maggie, we're not alone, you guys. You know, we're standing up for you. Help us to fight it. We're not asking much. Go to the school board, real simple. Find out where your school board meeting is. And say, how come you're gonna put a kid, a mask on my kid in two weeks? Because it says on the packaging, the masks don't work. Why are you gonna punish my kid for eight hours a day? I wanna bring up uh, Mr. Ed Wheeler. Ed did the invocation earlier. He's the pastor of Bible Valley Church in Middlebury, and he's gonna speak about, sorry? Valley Bible. Valley Bible Church, I'm sorry. And he's gonna be speaking about the differences in Marxism and Americanism. And that's what's happening right now, everybody. They're trying to destroy your way of life. Okay, thank you, Jim. I want to uh, back up a little bit from all these immediate concerns and give you more of a big picture. Uh, how many people are familiar with the movie, The Two Towers, or the book? It's the second book in the Ring of uh, Trilogy. Um, and there's a story in there about King Theoden, the king of Rohan. And he's on his throne, but he looks like he's half dead. He's mentally completely out of it, and he's not himself. That's because he's been poisoned. Poisoned spiritually and brought under the control of a destructive way of thinking. That reminds me of America and many Americans today. We've been invaded by a foreign way of thinking which I call Marxism, because many of the people behind this call themselves Marxists. The cure for this cure, the cure for this curse is Americanism. So I'm here to promote Americanism and to oppose Marxism. So what am I talking about? These are not just political systems. There are ways that we look at the world, their philosophies or worldviews. Now you might be saying, well, I don't know any Marxists. I don't know any card-carrying communists. But here's the thing. There are very few pure Marxists. But there are lots of people who have picked up bits and pieces of Marxism, including myself, because it's everywhere around us. It's embedded in our education system. Now the cure is Americanism, and I define that as the Judeo-Christian worldview on which the United States was founded. Americanism is the worldview behind the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution. Get them out, just the way they're written. Americanism begins with the ultimate reality of Almighty God. We find this concept reaffirmed throughout our nation through such phrases as, in God we trust. One nation under God. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. And with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. According to Americanism, the living God is the one who creates, who provides, who judges, and who rules over the world. Now, the morality of Americanism goes back to the Ten Commandments and the holy written word of God, the Bible. Americanism supports multiple free institutions, all functioning under God. These include the family, churches, and other religious institutions free enterprise businesses like Michael over here, in addition to the government and independent of the government. What did I do? I got too close. Americanism supports individual freedom of religion, speech, press, assembly, and petition. Americanism fosters individual expression and artistic effort, efforts that reflect the truth and the beauty of God 
and his creation. Americanism supports government of, by, and for the people. That is government by we the people. Centralized power is to be distrusted because people in power are easily corrupted and moved to enslave other people. Political diversity is natural and should be respected and preserved. Government power is to be limited and checked. Americans supports the idea that freedom, order, and cooperation lead to progress and prosperity. Americanism supports the free exchange of ideas and viewpoints. Americanism supports a minimum number of laws to be strictly and impartially enforced. This includes trial by jury. Americanism supports the freedom of all individual citizens to keep and bear arms. Americanism is the foundation of this country. This is what has made us great. Not perfect, but great as we work toward a more perfect union. So what about the invasive worldview that seeks to replace Americanism? That's Marxism. It's defined as an atheistic worldview that relies on human conflict to accomplish socio-economic progress. According to Marxism, ultimate reality is the physical universe. That's it. This is atheism. Accordingly, religious faith is to be treated as a form of insanity. According to Marxism, morality is whatever advances the revolution or equity according to the party. Lying, cheating, deception are all okay when they further the Marxist cause. According to Marxism, a healthy society is one of increasing equity between all citizens, and this is achieved by division and conflict. Marxism also teaches economic determinism, that all human relationships boil down to economics. According to Marxism, individual freedom is highly restricted to whatever the party deems good for society. Forcible wealth transfer from some people to others in pursuit of equity is perfectly acceptable. According to Marxism, individual expression and artistic efforts must support the revolution. The artistic products of Marxism tend to be chaotic, dark, and demonic. According to Marxism, only government of, by, and for the revolutionary party can be tolerated. It calls for socialism and total government control of our economy and all social interaction. All other institutions are to be subservient or eliminated. According to Marxism, progress and prosperity result from conflict between the oppressed and oppressors. Constant revolution, chaos, and conflict are keys to progress. According to Marxism, no free exchange of ideas and viewpoints can be tolerated. Opposition to the party must be demonized, crushed, and eliminated. Government thought control and totalitarianism is the goal. Under Marxism, there will be a profuse number of complex totalitarian laws. These are selectively enforced through secret and rigged trials to rid society of individuals who dare oppose the party line. According to Marxism, only the state can keep and bear arms, and I mean the federal state. So what will it be, America? Will we scrap the philosophy that made America great, or will we join the myriad nations past and present down the road to slavery and poverty? I leave you with a few voices from the past to emphasize the importance of remembering God as our nation. The father of our nation and first president George Washington said, while we are zealously performing the duties of good citizens and soldiers, we certainly ought not to be inattentive to the higher duties of religion. To the distinguished character of patriot, it should be our highest glory to add the more distinguished character of Christian. Our second president and founding father John Adams said, our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. 
Our third president and primary author of the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson, said this, God who gave us life gave us liberty. Can the liberties of a nation be secure when we have removed a conviction that these liberties are a gift of God? Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just, that his justice cannot sleep forever. America's fourth president, the primary author of the U.S. Constitution and James Madison gave us this, we have staked the whole future of American civilization, not on the power of government, far from it. We have staked the future of all our political institutions upon the capacity of each and all of us to govern ourselves according to the Ten Commandments of God. Benjamin Franklin, signer of both the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, and one of the leading theorists of the American Revolution, and one of the least Christian, I will add, said this, I have lived, sir, a long time, and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth, that God governs in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? So I will add, is it not probable that a free nation will survive without his aid? Abraham Lincoln, one of our greatest presidents, spoke often of the actions of God in our history. This is a brief example. Abraham Lincoln said this, I turned then and looked to the American people and to that God who has never forsaken them. My last voice is one of the most brilliant, brave, and eloquent leaders of American history, Frederick Douglass. He said, since the light of God's truth beamed upon my mind, I have become a friend of that religion which teaches us to pray for our enemies, which instead of shooting balls into their hearts, loves them. I would not hurt a hair of the slave owner's head. But I will tell you what else I would not do. I would not stand around the slave with my bayonet pointed at his breast in order to keep him in the power of the slave holder. These great people, and many like them, are watching us now. Will we support Americanism and oppose Marxism? Will we be brave and devoted as indeed they were? Will we call on our Creator and Redeemer to assist us at this crucial hour? If you agree with me, I want you to help me out by shouting these words when I count to three. Praise God for America. One two, three. Praise God for America. God bless. I forgot to announce a couple of things. Um, I put this together pretty much by myself. Um, I'm not begging for nothing, but if you all can help, I laid out a lot of coin and time and, and effort to put this together. I have a donation jar in the first tent. If you guys can help out anyway, that's great. If you can't, I am just thankful you're here. Also, there's a red bucket down in the down in the front, and I should have said this at first, and I didn't. Uh, I have brought ice for everybody. We've got lots of bottled water. Um, I brought water for everybody. We have lots of bottled water and ice in a big red bucket down here, right in front of this red little tent here. You're all welcome. You all come up and grab whatever you want out of that. And don't forget, there's petitions up there and also uh, some information on everybody that's been talking. I'm going to bring up uh, George Wilson. George is the district captain for a convention of states in Vermont. And uh, he's going to help us understand a few things that I can't explain, but I follow very deeply. George Wilson, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, you did. Thanks, Jim. Um, well, to all the smart people that are out in the shade, I admire you. Um, hey, I have some questions for you folks that are here. Uh, how many of you think that our government is out of control? Show of hands. Yeah? Okay. Those in the shade, I can't see the hands. Uh, how many of you are unhappy with a $30 trillion deficit? Okay. How many of you are in favor of term limits? Yeah, right? Okay. 
Well, you know, there's lots of hands going up in the air here. And I don't know whether you guys are Republican, you're Democrat, you're independent. I don't know if you're conservative or liberal or moderate. But we're all in agreement that this government is out of control and spending is out of control. <clears throat> Way out of control. <clears throat> so do you think that D.C. is going to limit their power? Do you think they're going to write term limits for themselves? How many of you think that there's nothing we can do about it? Feel hopeless? Well, we can do something about it. Our founding fathers, who penned the greatest document ever written, the United States Constitution, I repeat, the greatest document ever written, the U.S. Constitution, put in Article 5, something called the Convention of States. They knew that at some point in history that the government was going to get tyrannical and out of control. So Article 5 gives the people, we the people, doesn't matter what party you're with or anything else, it gives we the people the ability to call a convention of the states. So what that means is that we, as people here, need to get a hold of our legislatures and get Vermont on board with calling a convention. Vermont has to sign on to this. It takes th two thirds of all of the states in the country to be able to propose amendments to the government and bypass Congress completely. If we can get 34 states, right now we have 15 on board. We need to get that number to 34 and we can call a convention and we can propose amendments. And what Convention of States is putting forth right now is an amendment to control government overreach, a commandment, uh, an amendment to stem uh, fiscal responsibility, and set term limits. Those are the three things that we're looking at right now. So Article 5 of the Constitution is our best chance. It's our last chance to take the power back from the out of control politicians and bureaucrats in Washington and safeguard our liberty once and for all. So what is the Convention of States team's mission here in Vermont? We're here, Jason, Denver, myself, we're here to ask all of you to help us in a grassroots effort to get everyone involved, calling your legislature, le legislators, and getting them to get on board with a convention. <clears throat> so that means we need all of you. And that means getting active. Some of the speakers before me have actually said that. We need you to, you know, you can't yell at your TV and you can't just get mad on Facebook or social media. You've got to get involved. We need everybody involved to call your legislators, make phone calls, do what you need to do. Get involved with your school boards. Get your friends involved. You know, one of our guys was talking, and he has a very liberal mother. He was talking to her about Convention of States. She's all over it. She's in great support of it. You know, it may be hard for some of you folks. You know, some of you get threatened by your friends. Some of you may have worries about your job if you're speaking out. But I got to remind you that our founders, our forefathers, put everything they had on the line to create this great country. They put everything on the line, their fortunes, their real estate, their families. I'm not telling everybody to put your family on the line, but you got to dig deep and you got to not worry about having somebody not like what you're saying anymore. And, you know, I've lost a lot of friends. Actually, they probably weren't friends because they're no longer part of my life. So I'm, the nice thing about it on the flip side is look at all the people here that are like-minded and agree with what we're saying and I'm gaining a lot of new friends. And that's, that's great. So it, we have informational hands outs. We have the middle booth down there with the blue tent, a couple of flags on it. Jason and Denver and I are here for the day today. We'll answer any questions you have. We have a petition there that you can sign. Uh, again, it's a grass move, grassroots movement. We need all of you. Uh, it's the only thing that's gonna let us change Washington because they're not gonna do it on their own. And then based on some of the other comments that I've heard here today, I just wanna ask you all one question. Do you wanna be subjects of an authoritarian government 
that's telling you what to do, how to live, put a mask on, stay six feet apart, stay home, or do you want to be a citizen and have freedom and liberty? That's something for you to think about. Thank you for your time. Come see us at the booth. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, George. Yeah, I want to thank George and, and, and everybody here that's helping. I want to thank you all. Um, you know, none of the people that are here, they're getting paid. They're, they're getting anything except for the fact that they are understanding that they are making a difference for you. They're giving you the information and the opportunity to help you to make a difference, to make your life better. Take care of your kids. And uh, we're in a fight for our kids right now, guys. You know, my granddaughter, you know, we're in a fight for them. We gotta take care of these people. There's so many young families that I talk to that say, what am I gonna do? They're going back to school. Well, guess what? Nothing will change unless we start stepping up. So, you know, there's a lot of people here stepping up for you guys and uh, giving you opportunities, information, handouts. They're offering to help and talk with you and listen to you. So there's ways, you know. I organized a law enforcement rally last July and that all came about because I was sitting on the couch, you know, just like everybody else watching every cop you know, watching every media outlet saying every cop in the country is attacking and killing people. Well, you, you know that's a lie. Um, so I got off the couch. And I'm nobody. I'm just like you guys are. So step up, man. You can do it. Every one of you. You know what? When they tell you up here you aren't essential, your business doesn't matter, and your job doesn't matter, tell them screw off. Your job matters. You matter. Every one of you are important. And you can show them by showing up and step up, go to the school board and say, you're not doing that to my kid. There's no reason, it's not scientific, it's not logical. Stop pushing our kids down. Y'all can do it. I wanna bring up Greg Thayer, please. Gregory is a great friend of mine. He's traveled all over the state on his dime, along with a couple of other people who are really fighting for you guys and your kids. Gregory's a great friend, and he's going to tell you about a whole lot of stuff that I don't know a lot about, but he does. So listen to him, please. Greg Thayer, ladies and gentlemen. I, I promised Pam I wouldn't do that. So hello, I'm uh, Gregory Thayer. I'm with Vermonters for Vermont. I love Jesus Christ, and I'm a proud Vermont patriot. I want to take a second and ask you all to join me in giving a big hand of applause to our good friend, patriot, Jim Sexton, and his lovely wife, Shirley, who couldn't be here today. Jim, thank you for all you do, for your vision, and your commitment to Vermont Patriots. I also want to call out Ellie Martin. Ellie's in the red tent here, or under the red tent. She's not in it, but she's under it. Ellie and her husband, Glenn. Glenn's a warrior. He's a warrior, people, and he supports his wife 100% in all her endeavors. Ellie has organized, her and Glenn, the Celebrate America event that's coming up next month on the 20th anniversary of September 11th when those cowards from the Middle East attacked our republic. Gordon Chain's gonna be here. He's an international uh, person, speaker on China and American um, relations and teaching us all about communism, as well as Eric Metastas and Will Johnson will be joining. There's a Friday night event over here at the Capitol Plaza. Again, see, please see Ellie. And then Saturday, an all-day event at the Ignite Church in Williston. And you can go to the website, www.vtgrassroots.com. So please see Ellie. She's also selling some of Eric's books. 
and also um, go and register. We, we need you here. We need more patriots. And also I just want to mention, Jim normally doesn't do this. He did speak a little bit about it earlier, the donations. I've put a lot of town halls together on critical race theory around the state, and it can get expensive because you want to do the best thing for everybody. So Jim has a little bucket over here with some donations requests. If you have a couple bucks, drop it in, please. We appreciate it for Jim to try to, he's paying for all this himself. With that, I'm Gregory Thayer, Vermonters for Vermont initiative. We've been holding these town halls on critical race theory and equity around the state for the last couple months, and we've got some more coming. And we are teaching and reaching people, hundreds of people, maybe even you know, a thousand, and, and we're teaching them about what's going on in the schools. And I am very, very humbled that all of you are here today with us because we cannot do this alone. Jim can't do it alone. Jay Shepard, Ellie, Pam cannot do this alone. We need you to get involved. I call it, and part of Vermonters for Vermont is educate, coordinate, and activate. Your involvement can't stop here today. You need to go out and talk to people, educate them on what's going on, what you're hearing from the speakers, from Mike Hall, and what they're doing to the police departments. Also, what George just spoke about, the mass mandates, abortion, Prop 5. We need you all involved and engaged, and especially with what's going on in the schools, they're teaching our little guys and gals, they're indoctrinating them, they're teaching them how to hate. And we, we the people, need to stop that. So talk to your family, talk to your friends, talk to your neighbors, because this is happening. Most Americans are just learning about critical race theory and equity. Equity is not equality, as promulgated in the 1964 Civil Rights Bill, laws now, that we're all familiar with. It destroys a student's imagination, creativity, their hopes, dreams, innovations, and their competitiveness. It holds kids back because maybe little Johnny didn't like what happened and another kid's achieving. God made every single one of us in his image as individuals with separate, separate traits, positive, and, and, and you know, just who we are as individuals. None of us are the same. Equity controls outcomes. It's the lowest common denominator, and that is not good for our students, and it's not American, it's un-American. And I say we have to fight it. And it starts here, but you need to bring it home. Critical race theory is just that, a theory. It teaches children that they are either oppressed, excuse me, oppressors, or they're oppressed, a victim all based on the color of their skin, the melanin in their skin. There's a professor down at Boston University named, and sometimes I mess this up, but it's okay, Ibram Conti. He's a PhD, and he's talking about all white people being racist that we are inherently racist because we are white. And I don't know, I know a lot of people here, and I'm seeing a lot of people here, and, and I've, I've spoken to a lot of people, and I'm not seeing that ra white people are racist. I do not believe a lot of, uh, any of you folks are racist. I believe you're just out there living your lives and trying to do what's right for you, your family, and the people at large. Conti also wants to go on and create an office in the, in the federal government, an office on equity. And this is horrible, because this man from BU, his proposal is that one person would have all the control, a king, and the last I knew, we're not a monarch, and we don't have a king, but this guy wants to create a king that would be able to shoot down laws and stop different things going on and having more power 
than the collective Congress, the Supreme Court, and the President of the United States, and most importantly, we the people, you. He wants to override all of you, and, and that's not good. But we need to stand up. Critical race theory is in direct violation of our Constitution. Dr. Martin Luther King's teachings to us, the 14th Amendment, the Bill of Rights, free of freedom of speech, and again, the 1964 Civil Rights Act. It's reverse discrimination, segregation, in Dr. King's words. Everything that he fought for, stood for, and talked about, and taught us, is in violation. And you notice in, this, in the critical race theory, the equity teachings that they're doing, doesn't even cite Dr. King, doesn't cite Booker T. Washington, who is a great hero of mine, and also Frederick Douglass, who some of you may have a chance to meet, Kate Carl Smith that was just here with John Clark a couple, uh, couple weeks ago. This is classic Marxism, right from the pages of the Communist Manifesto, that the far left, the anti-Americans, are trying to shower, with us, shower us with. We, we the people, you and me, must stand up, stand firm, and stand fast against this now. Stop this hate, this Marxist teaching, and the indoctrinating of our students, our children. This equity filth, and it is filth, is happening in the adults' world too, in society. Make no mistakes about it. Corporate HR departments, parts of the US military, in other parts of our lives, it's going on. Look around, talk to your HR people. The words they're using, the things they're doing, trying to bring everybody as one, as one. And that's not good, we're individuals in God's image. We must stand up against this now. Do you folks know what the largest legis legislative body in America is today? Come on, take a shot at it. Where's Jay? There's Jay. Jay Shepard. I love calling you out. I love you, brother. <laughs> the school boards, over 100,000 school board members in America. And I bet you right here, right now, with the 20 cents in my pocket, <laughs> that, or what? <laughs> that 85% of them serving on those school boards are Marxist thinkers, are leftists, that are hurting our children across their school systems in their localities. School boards and superintendents are telling us that CRT is not being taught in schools. That to me, and in talking with our superintendent in Rutland, is a bold-faced lie. Union bosses are pushing this hard. And we just saw in the last month or so, where you know, with some of them, what they're gonna start doing and protecting teachers for teaching equity. And there's a lot of great teachers out there. All of us know a lot of the teachers. And, and I've talked to many of them in the Rutland area about this program, about this stuff. Is Ben, ben uh, Morley here today? Ben is a uh, state worker up in the Island Pond uh, area, and uh, he's been doing some speaking on, on, on CRT because it's affecting his children in the schools up there. And uh, he just went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the superintendent, and the superintendent called him a McCarthyist, I guess. <laughs> I guess it's McCarthyist, which, you know what? McCarthy was right, even in the 50s. He was right, but he, he couldn't get the audience. One question I have for that superintendent and all the superintendents, why do you have offices of equity in your de school departments? Why are we employing these people and giving them a title and doing this research? We are in Rutland, Burlington, Bennington, Barry, we saw it at the Barry um, at the Barry event we did for the town hall for critical race theory. So it's happening, and these people are on their leadership teams. So I want to know why are they denying it? 
but they employ these people and they're like probably seventy, eighty thousand dollars a year jobs. And remember, you all have the right to petition your school, school board, and ask them specifically, parents, grandparents, or just people who live in the community. I'm gonna call them taxpayers. Even renters are taxpayers. And you have a right to know what is being taught in the schools. And I'm gonna give you some words in a minute. They're kind of hiding it, but we're gonna probably bring that out. We all have heard of Liz Katie, as Jim brought up. She's fighting a good fight. Thank you, Liz. Go, Liz. You're working hard, and we appreciate it. We have, we've been receiving evidence of what's going on in the, in the schools. John Clark and uh, Dr. Aaron Kinsvatter, PhD, he's of now a former UVM professor. He was, I don't know if he's separated in a nice way or a bad way, but he had a lot of pressure on him because he does not believe in this stuff and he's trying to educate people. And he's not just an educator, he's teaching graduate level counseling courses. So this man knows what he's talking about. And they have received a lot of information, evidence from people around the state doing these town halls with me for Vermonters for Vermont Initiative. There's three words, these are the three words that I really want you to understand because they've changed the meaning of them. Diversity, equity, and inclusion. DEI is what they're referring to it, and, and you'll see that. It's really important that you know what they are and check your children's papers and books when they come home, the books that they're reading. It, it, it spells it all out in there. So it's really important to, to engage and get involved in what's going on in your children's school. Dan French, who is the Agency Secretary of Education here in Vermont, tells us that CRT is a theory. It's not promulgated by the Vermont Department of Ed, and it is not a curriculum. And if anybody wants to know if it's being taught, you have to contact your local school board. So that's coming right from Commissioner French or Secretary French. So remember those three words, they're really important. So I wanna give you six questions that are being asked, and I, I bring this up a lot because this came to us from uh, an event Ellie did up in Essex a couple months ago. Uh, a young lady in the crowd, a grandmother, brought up these questions that were being are being asked. That I don't know who she got them from, but it, it um, just six horrible questions that are being asked of of little kids. When did you become aware of your race? Number two, did the adults in your life have to address the topic of race? Beyond self-education, what is the most important action that you can take? Number four, and this is, this, is, this, is a, this is horrible, this one. Number four, talk about the parallels between lynchings and police brutalities of today. If you are white, number five, if you are white, how has your race affected you? And lastly, number six, what relationship do you have with the police and how does your race play into that relationship? Think about those questions and how horrible they are for a, a little mind like that. If that's not indoctrinating or leading there too, I don't know what is. So it's time. It's time to rise up. I wrote an op-ed about this and it hit a lot of the papers around the state. Copies of it are over there with Ellie in the red tent and Pam. And it's about you activating. Again, it goes back to educate, coordinate, and activate. You can't just sit back. I think Michael talked about it, Jim talked about it. You can't sit on the couch, friends. You're patriots, you're here. Be proud that you're here. Now let's do something with it. So in conclusion, critical race theory, equity, is not about race. It's about Marxism, communism, and them controlling and destroying our American history, our culture. 
our systems, our statutes, our people, and they want to destroy free speech, our constitution, freedom, liberty, and your independence. We need all of you to contact your school board members, your state reps, your local town hall members, select board members, city council members, and tell them no to critical race theory, equity teachings, whatever they want to call it. It's out there and it's going on. So I ask you to stand up, stand firm, and stand strong and get involved. You know, lastly, the last thing I want to say is Booker T. Washington, great American back in the late 1800s, the first black man to speak at the Atlanta Convention, which in the South, after the Civil War, was a big deal for a black man to speak. And he spoke in 1895, and what he spoke about, education. Educating our people is the best way to rise them up. So, in the thought of Booker T, get educated, rise up, and uh, let's take back and take control of our great nation. This is the greatest nation on earth because of you people. Thank you all. God bless you. Vermont Patriots forever. Well, there's a change in the program. Um, I'm going to introduce a friend of mine named BZ Lynch. We miss this at the beginning, but it's way too important to me and to you guys. BZ is going to sing the national anthem, so please rise, take off your hats, and let's, uh, let's welcome BZ Lynch, please. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave O'er the land of the free and of the home of the brave. God bless America and true Americans everywhere. Thank you. <laughs> Is Kathy around? Kathy Tarrant? Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm bringing up a friend of mine, Kathy Tarrant. Um, she's done some pretty incredible things around the state, and she's trying to help you. So uh, she's going to talk about what she's been through, what she's going through, and what you guys can do to help her and yourselves. Please welcome her, Kathy Tarrant. For all those who don't know who I am, I'm a musician mom, a performance artist and teacher. Fellow patriots, I have come here on this day in the year 2021 to share a story of my origins and what it means to carry on. In the year 1850, as Ireland was devastated by a great famine and the tide of eviction, my great-grandfather, William Tarrant, led an ambush at what later became known 
as Terrence Crossroads. As a stowaway, he left for Newfoundland, Canada, in what was often referred to as a coffin ship. Often unseaworthy, overcrowded, and nearly always without adequate provisions, sharks were said to follow them because so many bodies were thrown overboard. William Tarrant had been a teacher in Ireland. Next to the ministry of the priesthood, teaching was regarded as a noble and elevated calling. According to Caesar and other authorities, the Druids taught the style of Pythagoras, leading their pupils through number, geometry, musical theory, and linguistics into the higher realm of philosophy and metaphysics, and finally to the gateway of initiation, which brought understanding and acceptance of the divine order, and thus qualified them as worthy rulers, judges, or teachers. Even after schools of learning were suppressed by Cromwell, in every small village in Ireland, high standards of piety and learning were maintained by native bards. The medium of, of instruction was the Irish language and everything was learned orally through numerically structured musical chants. To counter this irritating persistence of culture, the British Empire introduced a nationalized education, i.e. method of control during the early 1800s. While many parents welcomed the opportunity, far more experienced a great loss of the vocabulary of the Irish country folk and the entire meaning and purpose of education as it had been properly perceived. According to John Mitchell, author of Confessions of a Radical Traditionalist, the most dreadful series of illusions came upon us in the 19th century. He wrote, Great men, ape-like, often with large beards, no offense, roamed the earth proclaiming theories. Typically, they had no interest in human nature and did not even believe it, in it, perceiving that people could be improved or at least rationalized by order of the state. The Mises Institute stated, in fact, the most glaring cause of the famine was not a plant disease, but England's long-running homogeny over Ireland. The English conquered Ireland several times and took ownership of vast agricultural territory. Large chunks of land were given to Englishmen, the elites of the time. In closing, I ask you to fight with imagination the English of our day. I am currently, currently a plaintiff in a federal lawsuit against Governor Scott. After the first hearing on May 10th, the mask mandate was lifted. Words matter. Our Constitution matters. The problem is clear enough that we are in the grip of materialism, rationalism, atheism, progressivism, and you know the other isms. Pray that we, the plaintiffs, continue to upset the enemy. I ask that you lift up fellow plaintiff Morningstar Porter, who is in hospital. Pray for Emily Payton, who has been on the, four, on the front line with legal related. They both became sick in recent months from the vaccinated. I also ask that you lift up State Rep. Vicki Strong. She's fighting the good fight for us regarding vaccine passports at all. And to freedom fighters everywhere who refuse to bend to the dictates of tyrants.
Ephesians 6, 11 through 18 states, Stand firm then with a belt of truth buckled around your waist with a breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. In other words, be strong and carry on. Well, I kind of feel kind of humble after that. Thank you, Kathy. You know, there's a whole lot of people here that are stepping up and speaking out and trying to help you. That woman right there is fighting for you. She is part of a case to go against what they're doing over here in this state. It's gotten the legislatures their rules, their mandates, which have no legal bounds. They're just using them to crush you guys. And Kathy's stepping up. You know, we all are. That woman's on the front line. Y'all need to thank her. And y'all need to step behind her and say, we got it, and we're gonna talk to our school boards. We're gonna go home and call our representatives, these people whose name you know, but you don't have any idea how they vote. So stop thinking that just because somebody's got an R behind their name, or a D if that's your preference, take a look at their voting records, see what they're doing. Ask them what they're doing, ask them what their freaking uh, policies are, or their votes are on things that matter to you. Like I said earlier, you don't have to buy in on the whole deal, but you have to buy in on the part that's important to you, and that includes the whole deal. It's the Constitution, ladies and gentlemen. That's the law. And they are trying to take it away from us. And, and what my good friend Maggie said early on, the legislatures are going to try to add an amendment to the Vermont Constitution, which is abhorrent and horrific, and basically gives anybody, anywhere, provider or a woman seeking abortion, it gives anybody total exclusivity from any prosecution. You know, you're a carpenter and you want to make some extra money, put up a freaking sign that says, I provide abortions. Because the way this law will be written, you cannot be held responsible for injuring or killing anybody. That's going to be the law if it passes. That sound pretty bad to you guys? Yeah. We can make a difference. Ask the people who are your senators and representatives what they're voting on and what their position is and do they represent you. And you know what? Every one of you is important. You know, look around. People tell me all the time, hey, I've lost friends and I've lost family during this deal because of what I believe in. You know what? You didn't lose friends or family because of this deal and your beliefs. Because if they are not there for you now, and what you believe in and what's important to you now, they weren't there before. So you all matter. And you can make your voices heard and count. And I'm gonna prove that to you right now because I'm gonna bring up a young lady who I recently had the opportunity to meet. And uh, she's not thrilled about coming up here, but she's going to. Because what she says is important. And I want you to hear her. And her name's Megan. Welcome her, please. You don't have to, because you know it's in your heart. That's all you got to do is say what you know. Is this going to go with me? Just say what you know. You're going to do fine. You can't do wrong. Hi, everyone. My name is Megan. I, I didn't come here with anything prepared, um, but I am a mom. I'm a patriot and I am here to fight for the rights of myself and my children. And collectively, a few parents from the Franklin County District have made a group um, to connect all Vermonters to find others in their school board unions um, to start attending school board meetings. 
I went to my first school board meeting ever on the 10th of August by myself, all by myself. <laughs> um, and they voted to give the superintendent authority to mask our children and follow CDC guidelines. Never ever notifying parents that they were gonna be voting on this. Um, I left that meeting and I promised them I would be back with more. And we went to a meeting on Thursday of this week with 52 other parents. And I promised them next time we would be back with even more. And I know parents in every county of this state that are doing the same things, but they need others to go with them. And so if you guys want to join our group, it is called Vermont Parents for Mask Choice. Please, I encourage you to go there and find some other locals in your area that are willing to pair up, reach out, expand to other people, um, and get together and go to your school board meetings. It's so incredibly important. Uh, we moved to the Highgate area about a year ago, um, the same time my stepson came from Pennsylvania to live with us. He has experienced nothing but remote learning here and masks, and he doesn't know what a single one of his classmates looks like. Not one. The mental anguish that children are going through, it needs to be stopped. We are for mask choice. If children want to go to school and parents want their children to go to school in masks, that's a decision for their family. But my family does not want to wear masks. We have not worn masks for the last year, and we won't because that is our God-given right to breathe air. So please feel free to join our group and invite your friends that you know are like-minded, even people that are on the fence, um, that, that choose to mask but, but also want choice. Um, I think collectively we can take on all the school boards. So thank you. Did y'all hear what she said? The first thing she ever did was go to a school board meeting on August 10th. You know why? Because she's a mom who loves her kids and is sticking up and fighting for them. So listen to her, talk to her, join her group, figure out how you can do that in your neighborhood. Because that's where it starts. You know, Megan didn't want to come up. That was tough for her. It's tough for everybody that comes up here to talk, but it was especially tough for Megan. You know, just a month ago, she's like sitting home and all of a sudden she's involved in all kinds of stuff around the state. A lot of people following her, a lot of people listening to her because she's fighting for her kids. And that's what I wanted to do today, give you all the information, give you the people to talk to, the resources, the pamphlets, the documentation, the proof that what they're doing up here behind us is all control and fear. You know, I'm glad she said it. If you want to wear a mask, wear a mask. If you want to get a vaccination, get a vaccination. Those people are not our enemies. You know, you're, you're, you're fellow Vermonters, you're our citizens, you're, you're our friends, you're our families, and we care about you and we want you to be okay. Our decision is not your decision, but your decision is not our decision, right? Is Chris Bradley here? I haven't met Chris before. Is he here? Uh, a gentleman came up a little while ago and asked if he could step up for somebody that's not here. I'm going to ask him to come up. Mark, come on up, please. A couple changes to the agenda. I'm not sure why or what happened. I haven't got notification of anything, but just like Megan stepped up for me, Mark is going to step up for us. And He's got, uh, he's got some information that we, you, know, call, you can all share and use. So please welcome Mark Custer. Hey, brother. Okay. My name's Mark Custer. I'm from down southern Vermont, Westminster. 
I volunteered for Jim to speak on election integrity. I noticed back in the spring, in April, the crowd that we had here that was one of the hottest topics going. Not many people have spoken about it. Um, I could speak on things all day long on multiple subjects. I'm sure you don't want to hear it. I want to go back to one of these other ladies that spoke and go off track for just a little bit. Um, I became frustrated last year that nobody in our Vermont legislature, not Democrat, Republican, Progressive, or anyone else was speaking out for the people about this COVID. Vicki Strong was the only one in 18 months to speak out for the people about this COVID and put this bill on the board for freedom on vaccinations. She was the only one of all the Democrats and all the Republicans. Now, I've been traveling around the state. I've been going to meetings. I've been following John Clark. I've been going to the GOP meetings. I've been at uh, CRT meetings. I met Kay Carl Smith. Now I want to give a big thanks to Kay Carl Smith. The guy is awesome. Absolutely awesome. What he did here, pure patriot, 100% true blue. Um, so on election integrity, why? Why does nobody in the Vermont Republican Party speak on it? Why are there senators elected in the state of Vermont that deny that there's any election fraud, deny that there's any computer hacking of the election system. How many people know that there is? How many people know that there's been election fraud and cheating in the state of Vermont since 1960? How many people followed what happened in Wyndham, New Hampshire? We know these machines work to the internet. Salem, New Hampshire runs the whole system for all the New England, Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, Mass. How many people know about Dr. Shiva and what he's doing in Massachusetts? You know, election fraud is very real. The computer generated election fraud numbers that Mike Lindell brought out. He says it's open source information. It is not. That was gathered by the military on November 3rd. Whoever says there's not election fraud, if there's any person in this state that's an elected official that denies election fraud and denies what's going on in this country with the audits, with Pennsylvania, with Michigan, with Wisconsin, with Arizona, These people are not here representing you, you know? And I don't need to point fingers at Democrats because I would expect this of Democrats, but where are our Republicans in this state? Do they expect to get elected again if they will not speak about election fraud? I wanna go off topic on that. I went to a school board meeting last Monday I saw the stuff about the mask. That's all they were talking about, about masks. I read the paperwork. You read down through the paragraph, it's masks on kids until they're 80% vaccinated. In the bottom of the paragraph. I spoke at that school board meeting. They've got me on, on BCTV in, in Brattleboro. You know, it's fact. Children are dying from myocarditis and they're saying, oh, what if what just one children dies? Children, more children have died from myocarditis, from the jabs, you know. I, I believe in what these people with the Convention of States are doing. I believe in it wholeheartedly. But I believe more in free and fair elections in the state, in, in the country. And we're fighting for not just Vermont, we're fighting for America, and we're fighting for the world because the world is watching on election integrity. And the rest of the world knows what happened on November 3rd. And it wasn't just the president, it was down ticket people too. It's been happening all over the country. It's been happening for a long time. Bernie Sanders knows it. 
He knows full well. We've got all this information backed up, documented, videoed everywhere. Go off track again. Internet censorship. Google, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. Follow Dr. Shiva. See what he's telling you what's going on with Facebook and Twitter. See what the non-elected regulatory body of internet censorship consists of. Jim Kondo sits on that board. Who are these people that tell us we had free and fair elections when they sit on a board on internet censorship, non-elected? Who are these people to pull these BS little audits and say, how many, I came up here to speak in lieu of Collington Harrington. They've been investigating Bennington. They've got guaranteed at least 350 illegal votes in Bennington. They're working on it from the bottom up. It's probably going to run to 1,000. Newfane's clearing 150 to 158 people off their voter rolls. Pittsford, New Hampshire had to change the voting machines three times on voting day. Well, thankfully, there was a Dominion rep right down there in Rutland. On voting day itself, the machines had to be changed three times. We have towns in this state that had 130% of the vote come out and vote. The voter roll was 515,000 people in December. What's wrong? What's going on here? Why was our voter roll 515,000 people? We have 630,000 residents, take off 20% for the children, 20% for the Vermonters that never voted and never registered to vote. Our voter roll shouldn't be more than 410,000, 405. And we never get more turnout than 75% statewide. There, there's something fishy going on. There's a lot of people working on this around the country. Real patriots that have been had their businesses blocked, censored, fired. You know, real patriots out there speaking the truth. I wasn't at the school board because I had kids. I was at the school board because I'm fighting for your kids, for all your kids. You know, you go back and reel back history, the lady speaking about Ireland, people talking about Nazis. Well, my father was born in Germany. He, he grew up through the war. He earned his citizenship here in this country fighting in Korea. Now, there's been a lot of suppression of truth in history. Germany. World War I, World War II, Afghanistan, Korea, Vietnam, all of them. There's a lot of suppression of truth. If you want to find out about Marxism, go back before the two world wars. Look at the Bolshevik Revolution. Look at Holdemore. I'm against Marxism, very much so. And I don't care who you know, it was, it was Stalin that said, we don't care who you vote for. It's all about who that counts the votes. I don't want to go off track too many more times, but this election integrity is a serious issue. We've got people working on it in the state. We've got them working on it from the top down. We've got them working on it from the bottom up. We've got the lists. We're going to be able to itemize that town to town. Hopefully we can organize people. Maybe 10 people can go through a town and 900 voters to see if they actually live there because we've got the addresses, you know. One of the things Colleen Harrington brought up was that there was a woman that moved to Canada in 1975 and they've been sending her ballots in Canada in, from Bennington since 1975 she's been voting in every election there's been people exposing voter fraud to Jim Condos and and Will Sennings for 10 years here in Vermont and they always get shot down every time they won't hear it nobody will hear it you all saw what happened with the elections with the courts saying people had no standing this is absolutely absurd. 
Our First Amendment rights, our right to vote, have been taken away, and it, it's time to make a change. Whatever issue you can work on, whatever topic, whether that be school boards or select boards or board of civil authority, talking to your legislatures, get involved with whatever you want to get involved with, keep moving forward, do what you can. You know, I put my flags up on my log truck last August in the fight and I'm going for it and I'm not going to stop and I dare them to cancel me. Let's see if they can do it. My name is Mark Kirsta and I'm running for Leahy seat 2022. I could do. It's hot. I'm going to finish up. Hey, guys, uh, I want to tell you all there's an opportunity to meet these people and talk to these people and question these people and get pamphlets from them and handouts or whatever. Please take advantage of that. What I want you to know more than anything else is that every one of you can make a difference. And if you don't step up for your kids, what are you going to step up for? Why are we here? You know, I'm 64 years old. I'm not gonna say I had a good life, I'm still alive, right? But you gotta look out for each other. You gotta help each other when you can. So don't go home and say, hey, that was fun or it sucked or whatever. Go home and say, now I have the opportunity to do something. But before you go home, I wanna talk to you about stuff that I've been finding out and fighting with the Republican Party of Vermont and politics in Vermont for the last 14 months. I touched on it a couple of times. There's a whole lot of people in the legislature, your state senators and representatives that say, hey, I'm for you, rah, rah, vote for me. And you vote for them because you know their name. Don't do that anymore. You need to go look up who's your representative, who's your senator, and find their voting record. It's all available. You can find everything you want. But the more important than that is to get a hold of them, call them. Say, hi, how do you feel about this, that, or the other thing? Do you represent me? Because there's a whole lot of them that don't. I started a petition, I think seven, eight months ago, to have Governor Scott removed from the Republican Party of Vermont. And I have been told on and on and on by the county chairs, for the most part, there's some county chairs in Vermont that do understand what's going on and, and have supported me. But I will basically tell you that 12 out of the 14 county chairs in Vermont and the committee chairperson have attacked me personally, saying that I'm gonna destroy the Republican Party in Vermont if I go after Phil Scott. So I'm gonna give you a couple of reasons why Phil Scott is not a Republican and does not support your Republican or conservative values. And I'm gonna start off with Planned Parenthood. A few years back, Planned Parenthood is getting $40,000 a year from the state. Well, Trump said last time he was in uh, the last year, he said, no money for Planned Parenthood. So the funding was cut off. The federal funding was cut off for Planned Parenthood in Vermont. Phil Scott said, hey, I'm your guy. And he gave $800,000 to Planned Parenthood last year. And he signed one of the most horrific abortion bills in this country pretty much up to the moment of birth. So there's your Republican values right there, ladies and gentlemen. And I talked about Donovan earlier. Donovan was actively participating in that bill. The computers in Donovan's office were used by Planned Parenthood to write the bill that Scott signed after the legislature passed it. Not conjecture, not a conspiracy, fact. There is documentation on it and I have it. So Phil Scott needs to be removed from the Republican Party. They want to keep him in the State House for, until his term is up. That, that's fine, the people voted. But I'm going to tell you who voted. Phil Scott in the last three elections has received 60 to 70 percent Democratic vote. You know why? Because there's a lot of Democrat Vermonters that are hunters. And Sue Minter, the first time Scott ran, Sue Minter said, I'm going to take your guns. We're going to destroy gun rights in the state. And she ran all around the state saying that. Phil Scott said, I'll stick up for your gun rights. 
So the Democrats said, hey, we got nothing to lose by voting for Scott because he's going to support us on all these other issues anyways. So they did. Then there was Christine Hallquist. And the same thing happened. The Democrats said, why should we vote for Hallquist when Phil Scott's pro-choice? Going to take their guns. Doesn't care about Vermonters. Cares about criminals, domestic terrorists, and illegal aliens. Now, I'm not going to attack all those groups. They have, there's, there's a whole bunch of reasons why I can say they uh, don't support you or they're not uh, looking out for you. The main reason is Marxism. I talked about it a little bit ago. They want it to be their way, and you don't have any way. They want to destroy families. They want to take away school choice, school rights. They want to create division. Listen, there'd be no racism if, if the Democrats weren't pushing it. And there's other Republicans that jump right in. Right? Look around. You know your families and friends. You know, we all know somebody that's not a real good person. But I'll bet 95% of the people you know are good people and they care about each other and they'll help each other in any way they can. Black, white, red, or blue, who the hell cares? Another Vermonter, you need help, you take care of each other. That's what we all do, but they don't. They want you to have their agenda. We want you to have your voice. They want you to have their voice. When Phil Scott says you aren't essential, he ain't lying. But I'll tell you something, every government employee has received full pay from the start of COVID lockdowns. Everyone, every teacher has. And 90% of them haven't worked that time. But how many people do you know that lost their jobs, had to, had to, had to try to squeeze by on whatever they could get and find it? Walmart wasn't closed, Costco's wasn't closed, but Joe's store down the street was closed. So it's not safe for three people to go in and visit this one guy, but it's okay for 3,000 people to go in this store. It's nonsensical, people. And, and, and it stops when you say it stops. You know, people like Megan, people like Carrie, people like every one of you. You're here because you want to listen and learn. Thank God for you. You know, I, I had a vision a couple weeks ago. This ground was going to be covered. And I got to tell you, it hurts that it isn't because I'm on so many pages and so many people I know have shared this event today. But you know, I'm going to go home and I'm going to say thank God for everyone that was there. Okay? And I'm going to tell you, like my friend Megan said a little while ago, she's just a mom sitting home and she got sick of it. Every one of you can do exactly the same thing and make a difference. People all over the state say, Jim, what can I do? I don't know what to do. I don't know how to help. Well, now you do. I just want to say a couple more things about Scott and, uh, and uh, Donovan. Mostly what I want to address is the lawlessness in Vermont. You know, you can look at the TV and say, man, that sucks in Chicago. New York, they're killing each other. They're doing it in Burlington. Store owners in Burlington have arranged for escorts for people to go from their car to their car because they are afraid to go out shopping in Burlington. And I'm not talking about at 2 o'clock in the morning. I'm talking about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So it's 35 miles away. It's right here. The mayor in Montpelier and the select board of Montpelier want to stop law enforcement. The state's attorney down here, Rory Tebow, three of my friends were assaulted, physically pepper sprayed, almost run down by a car. And the person that did it got court diversion. You know, court diversion, you're not eligible for court diversion if you create uh, an aggravated assault or reckless endangerment. And Corey, Corey, uh, Corey Tebow says, hey, it wasn't that bad, nobody lost an arm. So I guess, you know, you're standing in front of a car that somebody's trying to kill you. That don't really matter because they didn't kill you. But I'll tell you something else, after they do kill you, those people are gonna walk. Now I'm not looking for a criminal to be punished for the rest of his life. But if people don't understand there's a repercussion for hurting somebody or stealing from somebody, then you don't stop. Out in California, they've got a law. Under $8,000, you can take anything you want out of a store. You walk in, you've seen the videos. Gangs walking into stores, loading up freaking knapsacks and walking out. And it's legal. So it stops when you say it stops. The state's attorneys, many of the state's attorneys in Vermont don't support law-abiding citizens. They'll do everything they can to find a way out for a criminal. 
but they won't support you. I'm going to tell you a story real quick. My wife was struck by a drunk driver in December of 2019 while she was snow blowing in our front yard. She suffered massive injuries. Oh, by the way, it was the driver's third DUI with injury resulting. 0.26 Tuesday afternoon, 4 o'clock. His third DUI. We have it on security video. We have his license plate. We have parts of his bumper and car in the front yard. My wife has two rods in her neck fusing four vertebrae. She has to have another massive surgery on her lower spine to do the same thing. She has nerve damage in her left arm. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned it, but when he hit her, he didn't stop. He drove off. And guess what, folks? He got less than two days in jail. And my wife got life. So why does that matter to you? Because the people that did that to us are the same people in control now that are going to do it to you. Now, many of you know that I organized a law enforcement rally last year, and many of you know that I had real issues with law enforcement last year. I want to tell you, I have spent months working with buildings and general, secu general services and security, and I have been spending months working with Chief Pete of Montpelier. Sat down face to face, and we talked it out. And I know why they did what they did, and I know why they're doing what they're doing now. And I trust them, and I respect them, and I pray for them. And they were here today. It's not the cops. It's the judges. It's the state's attorneys. And it's Donovan. They don't care about law enforcement. They don't care about your rights. One last example. Black Lives Matter took over Battery Park in Burlington for three months last summer. Donovan decided it was his place. Well, while they are threatening the Burlington police, while they are blocking streets, while they are threatening people sitting down at diners on Church Street, Donovan went over to the park and he said, these people got every right to be here. They have every right to voice what they're saying. You know, it's important what they're saying. You know, oppressed people deserve to be represented, but people that threaten, attack, burn down, shoot, break things, rob, they deserve to be held accountable. Just like I deserve to be held accountable, just like you do if you do something wrong. All you gotta do is picture, you, hey, pick a neighbor, anyone you want. Go over to his house tonight and smash a windshield out of his car and go back home and have a coffee. Because nothing will happen to you. But your neighbor is going to be out and never be able to trust you again. So it all starts with one person. It started with Megan. It started with all these great people that I had here speaking for you today, giving you the opportunity to learn how to help yourselves and your family. You know, I'm going to go back one more time. Phil Scott and the legislatures and a whole bunch of people in Vermont say you aren't essential. Every one of you are essential. I don't care if you help one person or 10 person. I don't care if you help 10,000 people. You matter, your voice matters, you count, you're important. So I'm gonna shut it down. Y'all welcome to come over and talk to anybody you want. These people will help you out. You know, it would've been great if there's 5,000 people here, but it's great for every one of you to be here and I thank you all. God bless. Um, I just wanted to give people a couple of tips on where to go for more information about what's going on because we are having our liberty stripped from us through surveillance and I think the next big push, like they've done in Australia already, like they've done in China already, like they're doing in Japan right now, is to get rid of cash. Um, and cash is privacy and privacy is liberty and liberty is life. Uh, if they get rid of cash, they will know every single transaction that you do where that money came from, who's it's going to, and they can shut it down at the flip of a switch. So uh, if you want more information on that, you can look up Catherine Austin Fitz at solarireport.com, and she has a lot of good information on uh, going cashless. The uh, Bank of International Settlements and central bankers call it the going direct reset, uh, where they eliminate cash and they have a floating basket of digital currencies that they control people through. So look it up. All right, thank you.